This morning, before we open the Word of God, I do want to uh, speak a little bit directly to our church here. Um, If you were not here, um, it would have been a week ago Wednesday when I first told the church that I would be going to preach in view of a call at Livingston. Um, I had intended to deliver that message on a Sunday morning and not uh, on a Wednesday night, but um, Livingston is not all that far from Pollock and word was traveling back through people in the community and I did not want the members of this church to hear through the grapevine uh, that I would be leaving. I wanted you to hear it from me. And so instead of waiting, until a Sunday, uh, I had to go ahead and let you guys know on a Wednesday because I knew that word would get back before I had the opportunity to do so on a Sunday. So um, I wanted to speak a little bit about that because not everyone was here and more of you were here this morning and I just kind of wanted to address um, this. First off, God has incredibly blessed the eight years and four months that I have spent here as your pastor. And as I look out at the congregation today, I mean, The vast majority of you have come since I've come as pastor. About two-thirds of the church this morning was not here when I first came. And in those eight years and four months, God did incredible things that weren't a part of my plans or your plans. And as Gabe tells the story, after I told the church that we needed to start a pregnancy center, he He thought, well, this guy sounds crazy. We might need to we might need to run him out of Pollock. Something like that, right, Gabe? I mean, it was more or less. But then we saw that that was really God's doing. I wanted to point that out because we have no idea what the Lord has in the future for any of us or for this church body. We just know that He holds the future in His hands. Amen. And I believe that God is going to call a faithful pastor to come and shepherd this church after me. I also believe that the fact that we ordain Lanet as a pastor, he is not paid staff of the church, he is retired, but he is called and qualified, just as deacons are called and qualified to serve as deacons, Lanet is called and qualified to serve as a pastor in this church, and the church has his care and leadership in this interim time, and he can also be here to assist the next pastor who comes along. And so I think, it was not my plan when we ordained Lanet. I thought I would be here much longer. And I'll address that in a moment, but that was, it was not my plan that Lanet would be ordained because I would be leaving. That's just how God um, worked things out, that, that there are other leaders that God has raised up in this church body because this church does not depend on me or any one of us, it depends upon Christ. Amen? Its future is guaranteed by the Lord Himself. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And those words in Matthew 16, verse 18, are still true today. So, I want to tell you that I believe that this congregation is healthy and strong and will call a good pastor to follow me here who will preach the word and who will shepherd the people and lead this congregation to reach the lost for Christ. And so my prayer is that God would send the man that he has and that you as a church would obey his leading. Now I want to address... What's happened here, more directly, um, I had no intentions of going anywhere for a long time. Uh, In fact, my wife had just signed a three-year contract to teach with the LaSalle Parish School Board um, for the next three years after this school year, so that just shows you how bad we are at planning for the future. Um, I, I, I mentioned that to genuinely say there were no intentions that we would leave. There really were not. Um, I'm in the middle of a doctorate degree. Um, this, this may delay my graduation. Um, there, I mean, there's, this was not our plan. Um, so I want to speak a little bit more about this because I want to make sure that you've all heard this from me. I don't want you to hear it from someone else. I want you to get it straight from the source. 
I received an email one day uh, from the church in Livingston asking if I would send them my resume. I had never heard of the town of Livingston. I didn't realize Livingston was a town. I knew it was a parish. Okay, that's how much I knew about them. Um, it's, it's a town in the parish, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, so First Baptist Church in Livingston, I, I received an email asking me to send, me, uh, send them my resume. Um, immediately I thought, I have no interest in this. Um, I prayed about it, and I decided that, listen, God is sovereign. Um, it's not like if he wants me somewhere or doesn't want me somewhere that I'm going to mess up his plans by what I do. If God doesn't want me there, then I'll never get a call from them. It'll never happen. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I only want what you want here. And when I sent my resume, I sent it with the prayer, God, if you don't want me there, just shut the door and I won't go. I'm totally content to stay at Pollock for many years to come. Sometime later, I got an email from them um, telling me that they had been listening to my sermons online and that they uh, wanted me to follow up with a questionnaire, which I filled out. In that questionnaire, I won't go into it, but there were some um, doctrinal distinctives on some secondary doctrines where I would have disagreed with the previous pastors in the church on issues of like the end times and things like that, having a different understanding. And so I just said very plainly, this is how I understand the Bible. Uh, and if you don't want a pastor who, you know, uh, holds to my theological distinctives, I totally respect that, no big deal. Um, you know, God has the pastor that he wants for your church, and, and I'm okay uh, since, you know, I'm not exactly what you were looking for in a pastor. I'm totally okay with that. And answered honestly and truthfully uh, was not the answers that they were looking for, um, but I answered honestly and truthfully knowing that that probably meant, well, this is the end of the process, and honestly feeling kind of relieved. I'm not looking to go to Livingston anyways, and if I have a different, uh, if I have different theological distinctives on these matters and that's what keeps me from going there, so be it. The Lord knows what he's doing. And then I was contacted back that they wanted to interview me and I found out that the interim pastor at the church, uh, who's a professor at New Orleans Seminary, held to the same exact positions that I do on these theological matters and God not coincidentally, had sent him to the church to explain the differences in these things, and I never had to answer those questions further because the man that God had put there as the interim pastor held to the exact same theological understanding that I did was preaching through the book of Revelation as the interim there, um, and the church realized that, um, that my understanding of these things concerning the end times are biblical. Um, my, my view, by the way, is historic premillennialism. If you've been here uh, at the church, you'd know that. And so um, a different understanding uh, than uh, a dispensationalist view that they had, had heard before. Um, not, not that those aren't both acceptable and within the realms of Christian orthodoxy, but they are different. And if they were looking for a pastor that fit a specific theological position, then I wasn't going to be him. But God sent an interim pastor... Uh, to explain this matter, and literally, I, as I understand it, they were ready to set my resume aside and, and go with someone else until uh, that happened. I had no knowledge of this, and it was just another indication of God's providence that things like this don't happen by chance. They happen by providence. And I won't tell you the entire story, but when I went and visited with them, it is true. My wife will tell you the first thing I said in the interview is, I don't want to leave Pollock. Um, and Trish told me later, she said, you know, that's a really dumb way to start an interview. <laughs> and uh, I just was being honest with them. I said, I, I have no desire to leave Pollock. Things are good in Pollock. I want to just say to the church, nothing's wrong here. I'm not leaving because there are any problems or controversy or conflict. Sincerely, I am not. I would not lie to you. Okay? That, that is not what's happening here. 
I don't want you as church members to think is something wrong with our church. There's not. That's, that's why I want to tell you this. Because I want you to know it's not that there's something wrong. It's that I truly believe that God is calling me somewhere else. And I tried to throw up every roadblock I could and say everything that would get a church to go with someone else by just being maybe a little too direct and a little too truthful. You know, saying things in such a direct and blunt way that most churches would be scared off and come to find out this is exactly the kind of pastor that they were looking for. And you know me, you know how I preach. I don't mince words. And I, 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 when I went and preached in view of a call, I preached even more directly than I normally do. And said things like, if you don't want a pastor who believes these things, then don't call me as your pastor because I don't want to come and fight with you over these things. And, and, and the reason I did that was because I'm absolutely convinced that if God is calling me to Livingston, and He is, then by me being very honest and direct with them, that is not going to get in the way of God's call. But I don't want to go there on a pretense, a misunderstanding. I was totally truthful with them and said things that would make most churches find someone else. And when after doing everything I could to scare them away and talk them out of it, realized that this was God's calling and His plan, then I knew it was of the Lord and accepted the call. I want you to know that because church... First Baptist Pollock is a good church. It is the healthiest church I've ever been a part of in my life. And I mean that. And I'm not speaking ill of previous churches. I'm just being truthful. It is the healthiest congregation that I've ever been a member of in my life. And I was going to church when I was in diapers. You're going to find a good pastor. You need to be praying about who will serve on this search committee. And you need to seek the will of God as a congregation and call a faithful preacher of God's Word who will care for and shepherd His people. And God will take care of this church. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And all we need to do is not get in God's way. And, and I'll just say this, and I'll, I'll preach more on this on the next two Sundays, but I'll just say this now. Church, please, honestly, search your own hearts and seek God's will. And I just want to speak directly. I've been your pastor long enough just to be direct with you and honest with you. And it's kind of, I'm on the way out anyway, so maybe I can say some things I otherwise wouldn't say. But I, let me just be real direct with you. In a time of transition like this, we might be tempted to try to accomplish what we want for the church individually. I think our church needs to do this, and this is my chance to get it done because we'll be without a pastor for a time. Don't do that. Don't do that. What does God want for this church? Don't, don't try to accomplish your own personal agenda. Try to follow what God has. Ask the question honestly, what what does God want for this church? What does His Word say we should be looking for in a pastor? What kind of man does God call us to extend a call for? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Acts chapter 20, where Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders about what a pastor is supposed to do. These are the passages that you as a church need to be reading and praying about and asking, who's the man who fits this biblical description of what a pastor is to be? Not, not what do I think we need, but what does God want? What does God say we need? And it is absolutely critical that you as a church... And there is no major conflict in this congregation. I don't want to communicate that there is. There's not. What I'm saying is keep it that way, especially in a time of transition 
Because this is a very delicate time for this church body and, and we do not want to harm this church by seeking our own personal agenda, right? We want to do things God's way. So be careful. This church is precious. Jesus paid for the members of this church's souls with His own blood. Be good stewards of this church body. I have preached my heart out here for eight years and four months. And I'll just say to you, the church that I left in Texas before I came here, when they went to call a pastor, they had two men preach in view of a call. The church had a vote over who to call as their pastor, and they split because half the people wanted that guy and half the people wanted that guy. And the church has never been the same since. Don't do something foolish like that. This church is too healthy, too precious, too strong. So handle it as good stewards. Be careful with the church that Jesus bled and died for. Now church, please turn with me in God's word to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, we are finishing the Ten Commandments. And all God's people said, Amen. It is about time. I really didn't want to leave here without finishing the Ten Commandments. And we're on the tenth one. Exodus 20, verse 17. The Word of God says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, as we look at this commandment, we need to remember in the Ten Commandments how God divides them up. There are two tables of the law. The first table are which commandments, church? One through four. These concern our duty to God. The second table of the law of the commandments are commandments 5 through 10. These concern our duty to our fellow man. What's interesting about commandment 10 is it finishes the Ten Commandments and it brings the first two tables together. Because in the Tenth Commandment, it does concern our duty to our fellow man, but as I'll show you this morning, it also has to do with our relationship with God. And so it really does tie the Ten Commandments together in a very unique way. It says, you shall not covet. This word to to covet means to have a, a strong craving or desire. One that is selfish. One that means that you are not satisfied or content with what God has provided you with. This is important to understand what this word covet means. The Hebrew word translated here, it has to do with you being dissatisfied, unhappy with your current lot in life, and you feel that you are owed more. That's what it means. To covet says is the person who says, I'm not happy with what I have, and I won't be happy until I get that. This is important because if coveting simply means don't desire what others have, then that was really already covered under the commandment, do not steal, right? Right? Why do people steal? Because they desire and do not have. That's what James says. So, it's more than a desire to have something and the willingness to take it. But it is this discontentment with your current lot in life. It's not only that I want what my neighbor has, but it's also God should have given it to me already. It's a bitterness of the soul in which you are discontent with what God has provided you with in this life. Consider, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, didn't he already tell us not to commit adultery? 
I mean, why, why would the Tenth Commandment be necessary here if, if the commandment not to commit adultery had already told us not to take another man's wife unless not to covet his wife is related yet goes beyond the commandment not to commit adultery. You see, there's more to coveting than we might realize. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't look at what your neighbor has. Don't look at his home and say, I will never be satisfied with what I have until I get a house like that. God has provided you with what you have in this life right now, and you are not to pitch a fit in your own heart and say, God, why haven't you given me what you've given them? That's the commandment. It's not to be discontent, dissatisfied, bitter not only against your neighbor, but ultimately against God because you don't have what someone else has. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Now see, our minds might immediately go to the issue of adultery, but this applies to single people too. Maybe you've been longing to find a husband or a wife, and God has not provided you with a husband or a wife. And you have friends who have had that desire of their heart answered and you've not. Or maybe your spouse abandoned you. And not only are you mad at them for what they did, and by the way, they are wrong if they've abandoned you, but if you were honest with yourself, you're a little bit mad at God that you're in this situation to begin with. And you say to yourself, if God would just give me a husband or a wife like my friend's spouse. Or if God would just give me a spouse who wouldn't leave me the way that mine did. You see, God, I deserve better than this. When we do that... What we are really saying is, God, you owe me more. And what we need to realize is that everything that God gives us short of the eternal flames of hell is all of grace. I don't deserve to breathe this air right now. I don't deserve to have any food to eat today. God doesn't owe me a wife. God doesn't owe me my children. God doesn't owe me a paycheck. God doesn't owe me anything. It's all of grace. And if we think that God owes us something and other people owe us something and we don't get it, then we will become bitter against God and our neighbor. And that's how the Tenth Commandment brings our relationship to God in the first table and our relationship with man in the second table. The Tenth Commandment brings these together and says, don't be mad at God or your neighbor for the things that you don't have. And you will not understand this unless you understand that God created you for His own glory. And every one of us is a sinner who has rebelled against our Creator. And we have turned our backs upon Him. And what we deserve... are the eternal flames of hell. How foolish it would be for a murderer spending life in prison or on death row here at the federal penitentiary or at a state penitentiary. How foolish it would be for that murderer to say, you know, I deserve a PlayStation 5 in my cell. I, I, I should be able to eat steak every night. No, buddy, you gave up that right and privilege when you broke the law and murdered your neighbor. 
Do you understand that when we rebelled against the God who created us, we incurred His wrath and we deserve punishment for our sin? And if God gives us anything short of the fires of hell, it is His mercy. And if you don't understand that truth, no wonder you feel entitled to what you do not deserve and what God, neither God nor your fellow man have to give you. You see, if we don't grasp this truth in our hearts, then we'll go around feeling entitled to the things that God only gives by grace. Now, we are all here today breathing God's air. Every breath you take right now, it's grace. Every time your heart beats, it's grace. Every time you wake up and God gives you another day, it's grace. And if you would realize that, if we would realize that, then it'll change the way that we go through this life. Don't look at your neighbor's wife and covet her. This doesn't necessarily mean to lust after her. It just means to say, I wish my marriage had gone that way. Or I wish I could be married. And to throw a fit against God because He hasn't given you what someone else has. Don't cover your ne- covet your neighbor's male servant or female servant. Now, servants in this day, by the way, it was not like antebellum slavery in America. You you could not take the servants under the old covenant and say that that's like what happened in the early 1800s in American history. Not even close historically, okay? I don't want to deal with that issue other than to say this is more akin to an employee. Historically speaking, these servants would have been treated more like an employee would be treated by a a employer who would care for and make sure the family of those who work for him are provided for. And he says here, don't covet your male servant or your female servant. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in the role of a supervisor before or someone who hires others, but if you have, you know what it's like to be in a position in which you say, man, I wish I could get someone to fill this job like that person over at the other person's place of business. How many pastors say to themselves, man, I wish I could find a minister of music like that guy. I wish I could find a minister of youth like that guy. Right? Right? I wish I could find someone to work in my business or the place where God has put me like him or her. And you're looking around, seeing what other people have been given by God and the things that he's supplied them with, and you're saying to myself, to yourself, I need what they have. And if I don't get it, I'm going to be bitter against God and against the person that God has given me because my employee is not as good as theirs. My business is not as successful as theirs. My job doesn't pay as well or have as good of benefits as theirs. And because God gave them a better job than He gave me, I'm mad at God for not giving me the job that I think that He owes me. Don't go down that road. Is it wrong to desire young people? Is it wrong to desire a good good career? To to, to, to work hard? To seek a, a, a good career and a good job one day? Absolutely nothing wrong with it at all. Is it wrong for any one of us to desire if you're in a place where your job does not adequately provide for your family's needs, truly speaking, is it wrong for you to desire and look for something more? Nothing wrong with it at all. But here's what is wrong. When in your heart you become discontent and you say, if I don't get it, I'm not going to be satisfied. 
and I'm going to be upset and angry and unhappy and bitter until I get what I feel like I'm owed. That is when it becomes coveting. And the Bible says do not do that. Coveting is the sin of discontentment. And it is a sin both against God and your neighbor. Do not covet his ox. Men, that would be like, don't covet your neighbor's, I don't know, chainsaw, bass boat, tractor, whatever. Don't covet his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Whatever it is, don't feel like you're owed that thing because you're not. And if God gives it to you, and He may, it's all of grace. Everything you have is of grace. When you go home today, and you walk into your home, and the door doesn't fall off the hinges, think to yourself, grace. And when you flip on the light switch, and the lights come on, think grace. And when you need the air conditioner or heater, and we do not know which we will need tomorrow, amen? <laughs> but when you turn on the air conditioner or heater and it works, think grace. And remember that time when those hurricanes came through and we went for several days or a few weeks without electricity, and when it came back on, what did we all say? Thank you, Lord! I hope you didn't say, it's about time, God! Because he didn't know it till you did he. When it came on, grace. When you lay down in a bed tonight and not on dirt, think grace. When you have a pain and there's a doctor that you can go to to get treatment, think grace. When you get in your car and it actually starts when you turn the key, think grace. And if it doesn't start when you turn the key, don't think, dadgummit, I deserve not to have a car that does this to me. Now there's nothing wrong with desiring a car that starts when you turn the key. Nothing wrong with that. But when it doesn't start, don't lose your religion and forget that everything you have is of grace. Grace. The undeserved favor of God. Grace. It means a gift. Something you don't deserve, that you didn't earn, but Christ earned for you when He lived the perfect life you did not live. When He died upon the cross to shed His blood to pay for all the things that you've done against Him. It's grace. What we deserve is for this very hour our life to be required of us and to be cast into the lake of fire. But by grace, Christ came, lived a perfect sinless life, died in our place, was buried three days later, rose from the grave, securing salvation for all who trust in Him by grace through faith. And one day soon He's coming again for His church. And it's all of grace. And we will rule and reign with Him forever in an eternal kingdom called heaven on a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more sickness, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more our neighbor sinning against us and hurting us and breaking our heart, where we won't have back pain and neck pain and cancer, but we will live in a new heavens and a new earth for all eternity. And here's the thing, it's all of grace. And knowing that you have that coming, that this life, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, is a light momentary affliction which is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And they're all of grace. You see, if we would realize what we have in Christ, we will say this, if I have Christ, I'll be satisfied. If I have Christ, He's enough for me. 
I don't need the riches of this world. God may or may not give them to you, but what your heart should desire and long for is Christ. So what if He gives you the things of this world? You have Christ. And if you will be satisfied with Christ, then you'll know that any other blessings He gives you which are minuscule in comparison to what you have in Christ, then when the lights come on, when you flip the switch, you'll say, thank you, Lord. That also is a reminder of Your grace. Let us not be discontent. He has been so faithful. How dare we complain? Grace. Don't ever forget it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and I pray that Your Word has spoken to our hearts here today. God, forgive us. I have done this, Lord. I am guilty. We all are. We've all grumbled and complained. We've all coveted. Thank you that Christ came and paid for that sin too. And he offers us grace. God forgive us. Give us joy in our hearts and true gladness and appreciation for all that Christ has done. If there's one here today who has never truly bent the knee to Christ, confessed his or her sin, and sought forgiveness and salvation in Him, then I pray right now you would grant them the gift of faith and they would have the courage to come forward and make it known before this church family that I want today to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And for the rest of us, Lord, give us true contentment and joy and happiness and remind us that everything we have is all of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.